But um, anyways, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, um, if you can today. This is called a balance right here. I'm going to just jump right into this because I have a limited amount of time. But that's okay. Some of y'all are like, great, a short sermon. It's Easter. I knew this was the day I should have came. Okay. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 24. I'm going to preach a little bit different message today. We are beginning a series called The Story of Jesus uh, to kind of build off of um, the production that we just had. And if you, you get to see the production, it was amazing. And uh, just so thankful for um, those that just worked so hard to make that happen as well. We had 12 Decisions for Christ. We had a cast of over 60. Um, we had hundreds and hundreds of people show up um, to see it uh, from the community. And so just so thankful um, for everyone that, that worked so hard on the story of Jesus. And, and so today we begin a series called The Story of Jesus. Um, today I want to preach a message entitled The Resurrecting King. Um, before I do, I, I want to make sure and invite, invite y'all back. If you, if you don't have a home church, maybe you're visiting today, we have some amazing things. We have connect groups on Sunday mornings. Um, we have this series starting. We have a married life group that meets on Sunday nights. We have uh, kids and youth programming on Wednesday nights. We have women's and men's discipleship on Wednesday nights. We have college and career that meets uh, a little on Sunday mornings and some on Wednesday nights. And it's just, just an amazing church family to be part of. So come back, join us, be, be part of things with us. You're, you're welcome. If you're here today, you're family. All right? You're here today, you're family already. So um, today I want to reach, preach a message entitled, The Resurrecting King. The Resurrecting King. Luke 24, 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all the things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other woman, women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. And you remember the story of John. You can tie in a little bit of John if you want to kind of put a little more together here. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. What had happened? Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Why we celebrate today, Jesus is alive. But I want to preach a little bit different message today, if I can, entitled, The Resurrecting King. Because Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. But he's still raising today. He is a resurrecting king. He is a resurrecting king. You see, the truth is, death is inevitable. If you are sitting here today, unless the Lord returns within 100 to 110 years, did you know what the chances are of you dying is? 100%. 100% that in 110 years from now, almost everybody here, unless you're one of those people that Oprah does a story about, and you're like 120, you're going to die. Death is inevitable. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8 says, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to hear and to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time 
for peace. Seasons. Seasons. Let me ask you today, what season of life are you in? What season? Some of you here today are like, man, I am on the mountaintop of life. I am in a great season. I mean, money's just rolling in. The finances are great. Relationships are great. The Chiefs just won the Super Bowl again. It's a great life. Life couldn't get any better. And some of us here may be in a very dark, difficult season. And we say, no matter what I do, I try, and it's hard, and it's a struggle, and it's real. And I pray, and it doesn't feel like God answers my prayers. And I'm in a difficult, rocky, rough, hard season. And it was everything I could just to show up on Easter because I knew everybody would be wearing things, making them look like the Cadbury Easter bunny colors. And I don't want to be around happy people because I'm not happy. And I'm in a tough season. I debated whether or not I would share this today, but I felt like I needed to. Many of you, oh, we're going to do a series again this summer called Front Porch Stories where we hear from different people this summer and we'll build a little front porch setup here and we'll just have different people sharing their life story on stage each week this summer. In 1990, I was seven years old and my parents had been divorced. They were divorced when I was four and my grandpa was a big, strong construction worker and after my parents were divorced, my dad was kind of in and out of trouble, so my grandparents kind of got partial custody. I would visit my dad some, and my mom went on the road as a truck driver. And they came in on the weekend of Easter to visit our family. And I was seven years old. I was in first grade. And on that Saturday, they came in to see us, and we told them, we said, you need to stay for Easter Sunday church. You need to stay. And they said, no, we got a load of, we got a load of stuff we got to take. And I remember that Saturday, I had just started taking piano lessons, and I was picked on at school and made fun of for it, and I was told sports was cool, music was not, and if you played music, you were a sissy. And so my mom said, would you play me a song? Would you play me a song? I said, no, let's go out and shoot some horse on the hoop. That's for boys. She said, are you sure? I said, no, I don't want to play you what I've been learning on the piano. And so we went outside and shot horse for 30 minutes or so in the driveway. And we went in and sat at the kitchen table, and I begged my mom. I said, can't you guys stay one more day just for Easter church? And I don't think she wanted to stay. The next morning, they headed out on the road. They got up by St. Louis, Missouri, and her partner fell asleep at the wheel as she was sleeping in the cab and rolled down a 50-foot embankment. I woke up Easter Sunday morning, 1990, and I got dressed, and I came out as my grandfather was sitting on, at the kitchen counter with an old dial-up phone connected to the wall with tears in his eyes. I said, what's wrong, Pops? I called him Papa then. Now I'm too cool. I call him Pops now. What's wrong, Papa? He said, your mom's been in an accident. I said, is she hurt? He said, I don't know. But they're flying her to St. Louis. I stayed home with my little brother. I was seven. He was four. We stayed with some family as my grandparents made their way. They flew from Joplin. Had a friend with a private plane. Flew him to St. Louis. And... That night, the next morning, they came back home. They told us that my mom had passed away. I remember seven years old trying to figure that out. I asked my grandma what she did. She said when they knew that my mom was going to have to be pulled off life support, my grandma sat by her bedside and held her hand. She held her hand like she did when she was a little girl, putting her to bed. And she told her a bedtime story, and she sang, Jesus loves me. 
as she said good night. She said, I had to tell my little girl goodbye. And I remember the visitation. And I'm so thankful that we have a school coming to Celebration Church. And we're hosting it. And we're going to do everything we can to help them make it successful. Because the one thing that stands out to me about that visitation is looking up as a seven-year-old boy and seeing my kindergarten teacher from the year before and my first grade teacher together with tears in their eyes looking down at me saying, Brandon, we love you. We need teachers that care about students and love them for who they are and want to make a difference in their life. I don't remember a lot. I remember a couple of the songs at the service. It was really odd seeing your mom at seven years old. And as I reflected this week, I had one of the most real vulnerable conversations I've ever had in my life this week with one of my closest friends. We sat till after midnight at Denny's at Fly and Jay, and we just were honest with each other about trauma and life and what it feels like and how every year at Easter, I feel some of these same things, and I wish my mom was sitting here with us. And some of you all here today are missing someone in your life. I had one of our ladies pick these Easter lilies up this week because Jesus said he was called the lily of the valley. And that means so much more than just an old song. But the lily of the valley is a symbol of resurrection because he is a resurrecting king because he rose from the dead. And so today when we leave our service, if you have lost someone in the last year or two or three and your heart is heavy today, I want you to take one of these with you in honor of that loved one that you're thinking about. And I want you to know there is a promise just as seasons come and seasons go. You can plant lilies, you can plant different ones, and you may have to cut them off and say goodbye for a season, but they will spring life again. They will spring life again because he is the resurrection and the life. And I believe with all of my heart I will see my mom again. I will see my mom again. She knew Jesus. It was crazy. She had made some mistakes in her life, but it was crazy. A pastor's wife from Branson, Missouri contacted us and had a direct conversation with me years later. And she said, I want you to know, Brandon, just two or three months before she passed away, she got a hold of me and she had questions about life. And your mom and I sat down and we talked and she made sure she was right with Jesus. I know I will see my mom again because of God's grace. You see, God is a God of life. God is a God of life. We live in a culture of death, but God is a God of life. There's three things. Number one, he's a God of mercy. God is a God of mercy. You know, grace is something we receive that we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. He's a God of mercy. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Therefore know that the Lord, your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Psalm 86, 15 says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Psalm 89, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. You see, God looks through the lenses of mercy and grace. Did you know that? By choice, he looks through them. And when I put these sunglasses on, don't I look cool? When I put these sunglasses on, things look different. I see things through a different shade. It's not deception. It's the way I choose to view things. God puts on, by default, his character, his integrity. He puts on the shades of mercy and grace, and he looks way cooler than me. 
Because when he looks through now, he sees the world through the eyes of mercy and compassion and love. That's why the scripture says, mercy and truth go before your face. He sees through the lens of mercy and compassion. He sees you through the lens of mercy and compassion. Number two, God's a God of mercy. Number two, God's a God of healing. Isaiah 53, 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, every stripe, 39 times he was beaten for your healing. Jeremiah 33, 6, behold, I will bring it to health and healing, and I will heal them and reveal to them abundance of prosperity and security. Psalm 147, 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. If you're hurting today, if you're in a season that's very difficult, God wants to heal your broken heart. Number three, God is a God of redemption. God is a God of redemption. I'll keep this story short, but when, when we first started traveling on the road, Christina and I, we, we left a place, we needed to book a hotel, and we weren't poor because we couldn't afford the R. We were poor. All right, and we we had to find a place to stay, and and um, thank you, brother. Uh, so we called. We were out in Timbuktu. There were no hotels. We called this hotel finally through the. We we figured out a way to get a hold of them. They said, "Yeah, we got six rooms." It was one of these motels. Six rooms. We'll leave number three or four, whatever the number was. I would not believe this story if it did not happen to us. You can ask her to verify. Okay. We'll leave number three or four, whatever the door was. We'll leave the light on, door unlocked. Um, we got your card information. You guys just go in and have a good night's sleep. Sounded great. We went through the town. We just saw the motel, light on the door number, stopped, went in, slept, we were so tired. It was just an exhausting trip. We got up the next morning. We were at the wrong motel. <laughs> Talk about freaked out. So we had to pay for two rooms that night. We had to pay for the one we stayed in, and we had to pay for the one we were supposed to have stayed in. That didn't feel good. Did you know Jesus redeemed you? Not only were you his to begin with, but because of the curse of sin, he bought you again. He bought you again. You're valuable. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. Now I want you to think about this verse. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Anybody here feel like you're just weak? You don't have the strength to do life? Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. Any of you like, I don't want you to see where I came from. I don't want you to see where my background. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not. You may not even realize you have something inside of you yet. And God says he chooses the things that are even not to bring nothing things, no, nothing things that are, so that human being, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that you would be set apart for something different, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. His redemption. This is a resurrecting king. In fact, when Jesus stands... At the beginning of his ministry, he reads from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord, he's standing in the synagogue, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me 
to proclaim good news. And I think there was something about his voice. Although he was reading scripture, there was something different about the way he said, anointed me. And they knew he was referring to himself. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The writer went on to say, he closed the scroll and he said, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. He said, this is me. This is why I came. I am a resurrecting king and I came to shake things up and to change some things and to fulfill some things. And there's six things quickly. I'm going to say them fast, so listen fast. Number one, the resurrecting king today wants to resurrect your faith. Wants to resurrect your faith. Isaiah 43, 1 through 2. Now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Put your name in there. You are mine. Do not be afraid. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you go through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched. The flames will not set you ablaze. You say, Brandon, I feel like I'm treading water that's about to consume me. He promises, do not be afraid. It will not consume you. You say, Brandon, you don't understand the pressure I'm in. We serve a resurrected king that promises that the fire that you may feel of tribulation that you're in right now will not consume you. We serve a resurrected king. He wants to resurrect your faith. Number two, he wants to resurrect your purpose. Philippians 1, 6 says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. If he began something in you, maybe it was even when you were a child, you remember saying a prayer and believing something in your heart and you've drifted and you've ran from God. He wants to bring you back today and do something in your life and fulfill that purpose that he began in you. Number three, he wants to resurrect your new life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he says, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Maybe you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. Today, he wants to bring a new life inside of you. Number four, he wants to resurrect your joy. Psalm 51, 12 says, he, uh, David prayed this after he, he, he had fallen, he made mistakes, and he's, he's struggling with regret and remorse. And maybe you're here today, and you say, I feel defeated. David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Later he would say, restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold with me a willing spirit. God today, for someone here, wants to restore your joy. Number five, God wants to resurrect your hope, your hope. Romans 8, 24 through 25 says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they who wait upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And finally today, he wants to resurrect our bodies. There's a final day coming. And you're like, how can this happen when our bodies go to the, to the dirt? Again, how will he resurrect? You know what? If he made Adam from the dust of the ground, he can make us again. Nothing's impossible for God. He knew how much hair you had or didn't have. He knew what color it was. Gray, black, blonde, blue, I mean, whatever. He knew. He knows. And he can resurrect our bodies again. Romans 8, 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He's a resurrecting king. Would you stand with me this morning? What in your life does Jesus want to resurrect today? What in your life? We're going to sing. We're going to do this a little bit different today. We're going to sing another song. The band's going to come. 
And we're going to declare today a moment of worship. And Miss Molly's going to be down front. Pastor Michael's going to be down front to pray with you as we lead this last song. Maybe you're here today and you say, Brandon, some things in my life seem hopeless. Maybe you're here today and you say, I've never accepted Christ. I want to accept Jesus today. This altar right here is for us to pray. Maybe today you just want to sing and declare it. But we're going to sing one last song. And as we do, the altar's open. Receive the victory that God wants us to have today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. Lord, I pray that today, if anyone is here that needs to know you for the first time, Lord, today, they would come and kneel, that they would make you Savior and Lord today. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that just needs to seek you, they're just hurting, Lord, that today they would find peace for their soul. And Lord God, I pray for those that maybe there's something in their life that needs resurrected, maybe their faith, maybe a sense of belonging, maybe their joy, maybe their hope, maybe their passion, maybe their purpose, that today as we declare this last song, Lord, that you would resurrect life in them again. God, we thank you for what today means. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.